الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه جمعين ومن استنى بسنته بإحسان ليوم الدين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I would like to welcome you to another session from the commentary in the 40 hadith of Imam al-Nawi and alhamdulillah we have reached the 40 the Arba'un of the Arba'un this is hadith number 40 which is on the topic of the world is temporary. Beautiful short hadith. As we are winding down and you know, finishing and finalizing this beautiful collection, this is a nice hadith, which inshallah should give us a nice perspective of the dunya. And let us begin. The matan of the hadith is as follows. An ibn Umar, anhuma qal, akhada Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, بمنكبي وقال كن في الدنيا كأنك غريب أو عابر السبيل وكان ابن عمر رضي عنهما يقول إذا أمسيت فلا تنتظر الصباح وإذا أصبحت فلا تنتظر المساء وخذ من صحتك لمرضك ومن حياتك لموتك رواه البخاري Translation On the authority of Ibn Umar who said, The Messenger of Allah took me by the shoulder and said, Be in this world as though you are a stranger or a traveler along a path. Furthermore, Ibn Umar used to say, When the evening comes, do not expect to live till the morning. And when the morning comes, do not expect to live till the evening. Take from your health for your illness and from your life for your death. Related by Al-Bukhari. So the theme of this beautiful hadith, beautiful, short, but sweet hadith, is echoed in the numerous ayat of the Qur'an Kareem that compare the transient worldly life to the eternal life of the akhirah, the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Anam, and the worldly life is nothing but amusement and diversion, but the home of the hereafter is best for those who fear Allah. Will you not then reason? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Kaf, Ayah 45 to 46. وَاضْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَاتِ الدُّنْيَا كَمَا إِنْ أَنْزَلْنَاهُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فَاخْتَلَطَ بِهِ نَبَاتُ الْأَرْضِ فَأَصْبَحَ هَشِيمًا تَذْرُوهُ الرِّيَاحِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ مُقْتَدِرًا الْمَالُ وَالْبَحَيَاتِ الدُّنْيَا وَالْبَاقِيَاتُ الصَّالِحَاتُ خَيْرٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّكَ ثَوَابًا وَخَيْرٌ أَمَلًا أَمَلًا Allah says, and present to them the example of the life of this world, like rain which we send down from the sky, and the vegetation of the earth mingles with it, and then it becomes dry remnants scattered by the winds. And Allah is ever over all things perfect in ability, wealth, and children are the adornment of the worldly life. But the enduring good deeds are better to your Lord for reward and better for one's hope. Furthermore, in this muqaddimah of this hadith, Another ayah from the Qur'an Kareem which echoes this hadith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says in Surah Al-A'la, ayah 16 to 17, بَلْ تُؤْثِرُونَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى But you prefer the worldly life while the hereafter is better and more enduring. 
two ayahs which we have recited before on the commentary on Zuhud. So in these mentioned ayat, along with many others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draws the attention of the believers to remind them, remind us that the hereafter is the final destination and the real life and enjoyment and amusement for the believer is in the akhirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also states that this life is nothing but an amusement and a diversion. It is the life of tests and trials. However, please note, despite the fact that it is you know, not the real life, it's still a means of us getting forward to the hereafter. So that's the proper perspective of the dunya. And in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ instructs the believers on how to deal with this life. Two beautiful, short, and sweet wisdoms. He saw some offers us with two choices regarding how to live in this world, in this short time period that we have. His advice is brief but exceptionally profound. Furthermore, this hadith also echoes the concept of Zuhd as was discussed in hadith number 31. Right, The concept of Zuhd is very deep and something we need to not lose sight of, particularly in this society of materialism and also regarding the importance of not being attached to dunya. Okay, so this is very similar and just feeds off a stepping stone from the hadith on Zuhd is this hadith. Okay. And again, the main point here is that the realization this world is so temporary. Additional lessons, teaching approaches. So here, the Prophet we see that Ibn Umar said that the Prophet got the attention of Ibn Umar and he grabbed him by his shoulder. Okay, so here we see one of the various teaching methodologies of Prophet subtle but profound. Okay, the Prophet uses various approaches to be attentive and tailor advice to the audience. You know, he wants to get the full attention of the people, the beautiful people that he is talking to. And also to stress and emphasize the meaning of what he wants to convey. So if you want to convey something, make sure the advice does not fall on deaf ears. Make sure everyone's minds and hearts are not preoccupied with other things. They are attentive. They are listening to you. So you can get the full bang for your buck in terms of giving the nasiha. So here the hadith starts with Abdullah bin Omar saying that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu took me by the shoulder and said. So here the Prophet Sallallahu uses a physical gesture by putting his hand on the companion's shoulder to grab his attention. This is sort of a reflection for us that if we want to be good teachers, we have to sort of broaden the way we teach as well. And he, Prophet Sallallahu used to use many different ways. For example, sometimes he would call a person directly. For example, we saw that in hadith number 19, the Prophet started with, Ya Ghulam, inni u'allimuka kalimat. Indeed, I will teach you some words of advice. Other times, the Prophet would start his advice or teaching with a statement that attracts the attention of the audience. Thought provoking or rhetorical questions also were some things he used as well to grab the attention of the audience. Like for example, in the hadith on the bankrupt person, the Prophet asked the Sahaba, who is the bankrupt person? And he wanted to make them think about something which is very realistic, particularly to the Akhirah, and change their perspective to a Akhiri perspective. So the bankrupt person in the hadith, the Prophet said, was the one who did good deeds, did the salah, did the faraib, but because of his transgression against his fellow Muslim brethren, hitting them, hurting them, he would lose his good deeds and the sin of those who he hurt would be heaped upon him to the point where he would completely lose out in the akhirah. The point was the connection, how the Prophet gained the attention of the Sahaba to the point he wanted to set. Okay. Sometimes he also would draw diagrams and even like circles or lines on the ground. Other times he would you know, point to his chest to emphasize the heart. Sometimes he would grab his tongue to emphasize the tongue as the means of, for example, Mu'ad bin Jabal uh, preventing him or giving him advice to keep away from the hellfire. So all these are teaching techniques we should use and adopt so that our audience and students can gain maximum benefit. Because whatever Sadaqa Jari we're doing through our ilm, we want to take it as far as we can, inshaAllah ta'ala. 
because we need that hasanat, we need that continuing good deed through our ilm, through our nasiha. And also the Prophet some often would use uh, grammar principles as well, stress certain, be extremely eloquent also in his precision of the words he would use, give real life examples often to highlight and define abstract concepts as well. And we saw that for example in Inna al bin Niyat and many other principles that you've studied in this Arba'un collection. So now going to the hadith itself, the matan, the Prophet says, Kun fi dunya ka anna ka okay. Be in this dunya, be in this world as a stranger. Okay. So here, the Prophet uses a powerful metaphor linking us to being a stranger in this dunya. And uh, how eloquent is the Prophet ﷺ? Okay, so let's look at who the stranger is. Who is the stranger? The stranger is someone who is prepared to eventually go back home to his original place or hometown because he's a stranger in a foreign land. This land is not his final destination. He's just there for a little bit. Okay, so his heart is always longing for his home. His main concern will be to prepare for returning. So a stranger is different from other people in the current environment. Similarly, the believer should be different from those who only care about this life, the life of this world and the worldly matters because these are just uh, minutia in the overall scheme of the eternity of the Akhirah. So we should rid ourselves for yearning for this materialistic world because it will not help us at all. If we cling to it, it will be hard to get to it, our final destination which is up upstairs in Jannah, Allahumma Jannah, Min Ahlil Jannah, Ameen. Ibn Al Qayyim, Rahimullah, he says that a Muslim is a stranger amongst mankind. But not only that, but the Mu'minun, the true believers, the believers who are on high, higher status than the Muslims, are strangers among the Muslims. And the scholars, the ulama, are strangers among the Mu'minun. Perhaps you can also mention that those are the ones who are the Muhsinun. And this means that there are different levels of being a stranger. The lowest is Islam. The next level is mu'min or being a believer, following the injunctions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and staying away from the muharramat. And then a higher level is taking to the highest level of excellence as being a muhsin. With ahsan is that you increase yourself also the level through, through the knowledge of hidayah of the Quran and the sunnah. Going forward, the Prophet also said, "Kun fi dunya ka anna ka gharib, o abiru sabil." The Prophet gave us two choices: be a stranger or abiru sabil. What's an abiru sabil? Well, this is basically the Arabic term for traveler, the one who is traveling or crossing a path. Sabil is path, abir is someone who's crossing. So the traveler is actually a higher level than the stranger in being aloof and apart from the dunya. So the traveler is always traveling day and night without completely settling. So even though the stranger is a stranger in a foreign land and doesn't want to stay there, but he still settles there. And the traveler is even more disconnected from the dunya. And he is heading towards the final destination. So even if he stops for a moment, stops for rest, this is only just to provide himself with the bare essentials, the energy to re-energize, food, and those supplies to continue his journey and to go farther until he or she achieves the main objective. So a stranger may keep more material things in his possession than he actually needs, but this is still, the traveler is much more light. Okay, it takes as little as possible. Similarly, the believer in his quest, or her quest to reach the Akhirah, we cannot be weighed down by the dunyai things. Because, again, this journey is not about materialism. It's only two things. Our heart, our sincerity, our iman, those things which are in our heart, and our a'mal. So two things which we cannot see. And we need to tank it up, inshallah ta'ala. Because if we're light on that, it's going to be uh, perhaps a horror story on the akhirah. Because there will be many horrors as soon as we hit the graves. As soon as we hit the grave, people will face Adab al-Qabr, and then the, the Yom al-Qiyamah, and then just one test after another, and all 
and for those who are, have a mountain of sins, it's going to be just nothing but torture. May Allah protect us from all those trials and tribulations of the Akhirah. Ameen. So, not only that, not only about being light on the load, but the traveler also needs to know where he's going. And thus, he needs to obtain the proper guidance and knowledge. What's the use of, you know, you're going the wrong direction even though you're light? So, furthermore, okay, as we look back to our life in the Akhirah, this life will seem so insignificant. So, when we look back, it will almost appear like a blink of an eye or part of a day most. Allah Subhanahu wa says, كَأَنَّهُمْ يَوْمَ يَرَوْنَهَا لَمْ يَلْبَثُوا إِلَّا عَشِيَّةً أَوْ ضُحَاهَا It will be on the day they see it as though they had not remained in the world except for an afternoon or a morning thereof. This is the proper perspective of time of this dunya. Nothing compared to even the Day of Judgment. Furthermore, let's look at the explanation of Ibn Umar in this beautiful hadith. So, after narrating this hadith, Ibn Umar gives us some additional advices. He says, and this is also recorded by Al-Bukhari, he says that, When evening comes, do not expect to live till the morning. And when morning comes, do not expect to live till the evening. Take from your health a preparation for your illness and from your life a preparation for your death. This means that today we will be healthy, but we don't know the future. Okay, so do not procrastinate. You know, do not procrastinate. Do not expect to live to tomorrow. Do what you need to do. Be prepared to meet your Lord as if you are going to meet Him tomorrow. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to be prepared. If you're not prepared, it's going to be bad. Just like how any important event, if you don't prepare, it's often haphazard. So preparation is key to be successful. Thus it is prudent and important on us to perform the good deeds and to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now before we were disabled for because of illness or because of some obstacles okay. do what we can do maximize your hasanat the deeds which only you could do when you're young like for example ilm ilm is something which is so hard to do as you age as your memory fades but if you are prudent enough you're smart enough you will capture that ilm and solidify it when you're young for example or do things which you wouldn't be able to do when you're older this has also been stressed this type of perspective by the Prophet in other ahadith where he asks us to utilize our time well and do beneficial things for this life and the hereafter this hadith also by implementing it it will protect us from being beguiled from the life of this dunya which is fleeting which is deceptive Okay. Furthermore, we can use the dunya as a tool so that we can be successful in the next life. So we use this life so that it's preparation for our death in the proper way. So understanding and applying this hadith gives us many benefits. Number one, safeguarding ourselves from self-interest, from our hawa, from our desires, from our shahawat, for early temptations as well. Increasing our awareness and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Increasing our awareness of the final destination. And we also fulfill, of course, our duties to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also follow the Prophet sallallahu Fulfill also our duties to our fellow man as well because we're going to be asked about their rights as well that if we fulfill them. This hadith should motivate us to be closer to Allah at all times. Ittaqullah haytu ma kunt. And also, as we saw in hadith number 34, to enjoy which is good and forbid the evil. This is part and parcel of being a Muslim. And also maximize self-accountability and self-reckoning. Hasibu and fusakum kabla yuhasabu. And encouraging us to minimize and avoid weaknesses, shortcomings, and sinful acts. Remember, all of us have weaknesses. Remember, sometimes we are only as strong as our weakest link. So our weaknesses will weigh us down. So we have to minimize and avoid those weaknesses and be mindful of our weaknesses and Always seek refuge with Allah from the shaitan and the evil. Allahumma an haqqa haqqan wa tiba'a wa an al-batila batila wa zukna tinaba. So contemporary and global challenges. There are so many challenges that we see which are hindering us or which can hinder us in applying this beautiful hadith. Particularly since we have 
you know, globalization, we have the internet, we have social media, we have modern technology, you know, things at our fingertips. There has been the gross promotion of materialism in practically all aspects of life. So materialism has become, unfortunately, the status quo. Furthermore, we've seen the promotion of Western values, which often are antithetic to spirituality. But the more complex modern life is becoming, the more emphasis and attachment to the dunya. And what has happened is that there are many different problems which this has caused. I mean, there's imbalance between the old and the modern lifestyles. There's the promotion of secularism and secular lifestyles versus the traditional Islamic lifestyle, for example. There's a promotion of atheism versus being God-fearing. There's an emergence of new social values which conflict with the spiritual values, which conflict with zuhud, being aloof from this dunya, indifferent to this dunya, and also things which are going against directly the human fitra. For also, there's social media which is promoting social ills such as impiety, greed, and imbuing us with improper values contrary to what Allah and His Messenger have taught us as those things which, are, which make people successful. So, decrease in religious awareness, decrease in religious education and tazkiyah, all these things are challenges we need to deal with and be successful in. Otherwise, things are going to be very detrimental for us and also our generations. So, we need to be aware of all these hindrances and guard ourselves from them. So applying this hadith and also others from this beautiful collection of Allah Arba'un will go a long way to protecting us from these corrupt values which are rampant in our contemporary society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in Surah Fatir, Ya inna wa'da Allahi haqq fala taghurrannakumul hayatu dunya wala yaghurrann O oh mankind, indeed the promise of Allah is true. So let not the worldly life delude you and do not be deceived about Allah by the deceiver. Next topic from this hadith. Balancing worship and the dunya. So ubudiyah. This is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a comprehensive concept around which our life should revolve around because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ The only purpose of creation is لِيَعْبُدُونَ So that we worship Him. So in fact, truly adhering to Udhiyya allows us to transform apparently even non-religious worldly actions into ibadah when it's guided by revelation and a pure intention. So if our actions are done in accordance with the Sharia, okay, this is the blueprint from revelation. The life of this world will correspond with the Akhirah. And the Muslim's life in this world becomes then submission and devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even more, that the servant still can enjoy this life in accordance to and in concordance to the divine guidelines. Okay, so he lives his life with the surety that his future is being secure in the Akhirah with innumerable rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's also able to enjoy life under the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's law. So Islam teaches us to be well balanced in life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want us to totally shun the life of this dunya. And thus there is no form of rahbaniyyah or monasticism in Islam. Islam is based on moderation which allows an optimal balance between the life of this world and also our pursuit of the hereafter. It is obligatory for the believers to cultivate this earth as an amana and for the establishment of Islamic civilization which is based on tawheed good manners and akhlaq and values and divine guidance. Okay. For example, Abdul Qadir al-Jalani, he says, remove the dunya from the heart and place it in your hand or your pocket. Then it will not harm you. Beautiful advice. Okay. So altogether, putting everything in perspective from this beautiful hadith, this hadith gives us a proper perspective that this life is temporary and we should not get too attached to it. Okay. The Prophet Wasallam also he gave us two choices in terms of how to live our life in this world, either as a stranger or as a traveler. Being attached to the dunya and its vices will cause us damage okay, and can lead to our death in the akhirah. But however, if we utilize it properly, it can yield us eternal success. Unfortunately, contemporary society is being overwhelmed with the evil value system and lifestyle which promotes secularism, immorality, and cultural of instant gratification and many other social ills. 
So we cannot give in to our desires. We have to restrain them. These are increasingly promoted through globalization, social media, advanced technology as well, because now our desires, in a sense, are at our fingertips. And it's unfortunate that so many Muslims also have been warped into and negatively affected by these forces and are becoming, unfortunately, excessively attached to the dunya, forgetting their role and responsibility, forgetting about subhanahu wa ta'ala and just being slaves to his dunya and it's also falling its evils. So a Muslim keeps the world and the material world in his hand and does not allow it to enter the heart. He does not, she does not love the dunya. It's, we should have indifference, zuhud, to the dunya. So the solution in protecting ourselves from the negative influence of this world is to retain a strong and unrelenting connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also be continuously reminded that this world is extremely deceptive and is very transitory. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Hud, Ayah 15 to 16. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa says, Whoever desires the life of this world and its adornments, we fully repay them for their deeds therein, and they therein will not be deprived. Those are the ones for whom there is not in the hereafter but the fire. And loss is what they did therein and worthless is what they used to do. What a severe penalty and punishment for those who are just desiring and unrelenting in their desire of this world and its adornments. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us tawfiq from these beautiful wisdoms, this beautiful prophetic advice, and also the many Quranic ayat which echo this sentiment of this hadith. May Allah allow us to give us the proper perspective of the دنيا and the آخرة سبحانك اللهم وحمدك ونشهد ولا إله إلا أنت وصلك فتوبوا إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.